The following interview is being conducted with Dr. Teresa Roche for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It's taking place on March 9, 2020 at 9 o'clock in the morning at Purdue University. The interviewer is Katie Watson, the France A. Cordova archivist. So, Teresa, can you tell me a little bit about your early life? So, when and where were you born? Who are your parents? Of course, Katie. So, I was born in Highland, Indiana, which is in the northwest part of the state, close to Chicago, uh, June 19, 1956. And I was the youngest of seven children. Oh, I have wow. five older brothers, which I will weave into some of my stories, and one older sister, uh, Irish Catholic. And so that was a very influential part to be raised in that religion. Um, my parents were both remarkable. There was things that were not always completely functional, but when you zoom out, you just see there was gifts that they gave all of us. Um, my father served in World War II and he was a POW in Salek 17 for 13 months. And as I have gotten older, I realize as I read more about it and reflect on the stories he would tell me, that had a huge impact, obviously, on his life. And so some of the traits that he possessed, I can see how they were formed by that time. Uh, he was married to my mother at that time. Um, they were in Hammond, Indiana. They had met in grade school. Mm -hmm. So they had fallen in love since um, grade school. Mm -hmm. And that was just a very special part of their relationship to be um, grade school classmates. I'll later on share that they did not stay together, but it was amazing. Um, my mother had David, my oldest, when my father was um, overseas. He was shot down in the Baltic Sea on wow. a bombing mission over Poland. And what was fascinating is he was in the Army Air Corps, which became the later day Air Force. And his stories about that time, Katie, and the glimpses he gave me of the Stalag 17, which was a prison of war camp was very much like a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a prolific writer, Katie, and she wrote a, a, a story about what it was like to keep the light on for my dad when mm -hmm. he was gone. And I just can't even imagine what that must have been like for her. Mm -hmm. um, we get my brother David in a, a wonderful way because one of the parts of my family is that we have unbelievable humor as a way to manage life. And my dad once told me this story that when he was in the Baltic Sea and he thought he was going to die at that moment, that he saw a boat coming towards him and a hand reached out and he thought it was his young son David who was just a baby. So whenever we like to say to David, you're the one that saved dad so the rest of us can be born. <laughs> um, my father would be what you would call in the greatest generation as was my mom. Um, and one of the things that defined them and certainly influenced all of us was they served the community in many different ways. They were both involved in the church. They were both involved in community organizations. My father actually one time ran for U.S. Senator or oh, House wow. of Representatives, excuse me, against Ray J. Madden, mm -hmm. who was the Speaker of the House Ways and Means, in, you know, representing that area. So that awareness and the way they read and the way we grew up in service to something bigger than ourselves really defined me. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed for the position I'm currently in, which is the Chief Human Resources Officer for the City of Fort Collins, um, I had to write what influenced me and to speak a little bit about myself. And what I said is that curiosity, community, and contribution really shaped me when I was younger because of my parents and my older siblings. Uh, being born in 56, um, you know, I was a child of the 60s. Do you need to check that? No? Okay. Um, and so that whole uh, orientation was quite stunning. And some of the thoughts I just want to share, Katie, is my mother went back to work when I went to kindergarten. So she was home from work for 18 years because wow. my oldest brother's 13 years older than me. Mm -hmm. And I think my mother was definitely a woman who really needed to express herself through a, a work chapter. And um, what's pretty amazing as I look back at it, that she was able to find a position immediately. 
My mother had gotten a full scholarship to go to college, and the family story is that I only have glimpses of, because no one's alive to ground this as far as fact, but it seems true, that my mother lost a sister when she was beginning in high school, and that my grandmother never quite recovered from that, and so my mother came home from college, I think in her second year, mm -hmm. to just take care of the family. Um, but I just remember my mother working, and we had very little gender bias at home. Oh. Uh, why I say that is uh, we would have these Roach family meetings to talk about the harmony of what it meant to be as a family, and we would sign these contracts about how we would you know, uh, maintain order by taking care of our rooms. We each were assigned a work area. And I remember as a very young four-year-old, I was given the bathroom to clean, which was not fun with <laughs> no <worries for> <laughs> nine people. <laughs> but it was, but I learned just the value of work. And my brothers were assigned the same things as my sister and I. So when my mom went back to work, we would divide up who was going to cook dinner. She would prepare a menu, on the weekend, she might make things that could be heated up, but I was assigned with my brother Patrick, who was the oldest of the three younger boys, we called them. Uh, so I just grew up seeing my brothers um, cook, uh, clean the house. My dad did the grocery shopping. Uh, we all helped with the laundry. So I wasn't present to any gender bias, and we were all encouraged to continue to be who we were, to further our education. That's just pretty stunning. And all seven of us, all seven children, graduated from college. Neither of my parents did. They both went. Neither of them finished. Mm -hmm. um, but they were both highly intelligent, and reading was just a constant in our life. Sometimes people ask me how am I able to speak comfortably in front of groups, and I tell <laughs> them that my dad would do these. Um, we would do things after dinner because we had very little money. In fact, Katie, there were times where the... You know, gas was turned off, just always a challenge with seven kids. And um, uh, my dad would have us do these academic games or things that were just fun, and we loved it. But the one was extemporaneous speeches. And so in front of the rest of the family at the dining room table, you would get a topic, and you would need to speak for a minute. Uh -huh. And um, Katie, that was just such a great <laughs> opportunity, and of course... If my audience was my brothers, who often were the main audience, and they were doing things to try and get me off my game, and I was really little, <laughs> no other audience has ever compared um, so much to that. And that was just really special. And again, um, being a female, being the youngest, I just always felt like I was part of the family. Now what's interesting is my family I would define as highly intelligent, very athletic, um, and very playful. So we had many friends and we were, you know, had quite a community around us. But I remember when I was little feeling like I wasn't a true roach because I didn't feel as intelligent, I didn't feel as athletic, I didn't feel as funny. Um, and I'm, I suppose as the youngest you have that comparison. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'll talk about later is Purdue helped me know who I was, mm -hmm. independent of being a, a member of a family of nine, which was just a huge influence. Um, I'm just going to look at my notes, see if there's anything else that I wanted to, to say. Um, when I mentioned that my parents divorced, it was actually in my senior year that my father left my mom for another woman very, very uh, traumatic. They'd been together for a very long time. Um, my mother actually, as I'll talk later, died in my graduate school program, so five years after that happened. Um, and I remember her telling me, Katie, and this tells you something about my mother, she had amazing equanimity, amazing equanimity. She said to me once, she was so glad that my father had found Tina, his second wife, who was younger than him because she said she knew that Tina would be able to take care of my dad as he got older. Mm -hmm. To be able to say that was just profound. Um, so as I mentioned, they were both outstanding writers. My dad wrote a sports column mm -hmm. in the Catholic newspaper. So just the oral uh, speaking, the written word, um, you see that in a lot of my siblings. And I personally love to write as a way to make meaning, and I know that that was definitely shaped during that time with them. We grew up in a house that was my great uncle's. 
that he had built. He was a Norwegian shipbuilder. And so it was this house with a lot of character. And if you were to go to Highland, there's still some of my classmates there. They will talk about the Roach House on the Hill. And whenever I go back for a high school reunion, I go back there because there's so many memories. And the man that bought our house, Tom Sorless, I've actually go back and visit with him. And um, he just talks with great love for that house because it had so much distinctive character. And so it's really sweet to see how he's been able to keep the essence of that home. And it was on probably about an acre on a hill. And just the wild um, plants that he's been able to keep, it just gives me a great deal of um, heart space. Mm -hmm. He's also a brilliant stained glass artist. And he bought my aunt's cottage on the property after a cousin moved out of it. And that's his studio. And when I went back one year, I said, Tom, I'm going to buy a stained glass lamp from you. And I want to find one that you will tell me our property and the plants that were still there spoke to you. So in my life area now in Fort Collins, Colorado, I have a lamp that when I look at it, it just reminds me of the, the woods in that part of my my childhood. That's beautiful. Yeah, I feel very blessed, That's a Katie. Very special yeah. Possession to have to yeah. remind you of your childhood. It does. And I have all kinds of other things that remind my, my childhood. And Katie, just one last thing before we move to the next question. Um, when I was younger, I would say, my parents got divorced, you know, my mom died, this happened, and I would speak about it just as facts in a story. And over the years, now that I'm going to be 64 in June, you go back and look at those stories. And I was trying to find a picture for my oldest brother, David. And he, um, I had this family tub, and I didn't want to go in there because once I open the tub, I go back into all these memories. But as I was flipping through, I found pictures of my mom and dad's wedding and pictures of when they were together. And I had this surge of reaction where I realized it wasn't a single story. There was so much to their story. Mm -hmm. So I actually took one of these pictures where you could tell they were boundlessly happy, and they had seven kids, um, and had it um, digitized and just refurbished or whatever you call it. And I now have that in my life area because I realize the fact that they divorced was just one aspect of a much richer and fuller mm -hmm. story that they went through. And so I have various mementos of just memories of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Coco. Oh, it's yeah. a beautiful yeah. <laughs> So after watching that, I actually took a picture of the nine of us and had that redone so I could have my Coco picture. <laughs> 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 Yeah. That is a very good way of looking at it. Yeah, it is. Um, many times our stories from when we're younger can hijack us because we might have a felt or charged reaction to them. And I've been very blessed through many workshops and other things that I've done to go back and retell the story in a way that you see its glory, its beauty, not without hiding what was dark or hard about it, but seeing the, the beauty of it. And so I've feel really comfortable. I've been able to do that a lot. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it sounds like you had a really influenced, influential childhood. I did. Um, so it so also sounds like you had a lot, so a lot of your interests were in the arts, so like oral and like oratory and writing. Um, did those interests lead you to kind of your profession now? Like what kind of interest did you have during yeah. high school and growing up? Sure. So Katie, what's interesting, and this story reveals a lot about my parents as well, I actually was academically strong in what's now called STEM. Oh, okay. And my test results were very strong. And I was at a Catholic grade school, and my parents sat me down one time and they said, based on your test scores, this is where you are showing strength. The Catholic school does not have good quality education in these subjects. It's going to be your choice. Would you like to go to the public junior high where they have a stronger program? Mm -hmm. Katie, I mean, I was in sixth grade. What an amazing degree of freedom that my parents gave me. 
I mean, those are those stories that I go back and I say, wow. And they went with me to meet the Mr. Brown, who was the high school or the junior high counselor, to talk about what the junior high could offer me. Now, mind you, I was the seventh of the seven. Everybody had graduated from this Catholic grade school, so I became the heretic and actually <laughs> decided to go to the public school for seventh grade. Um, and of course, all my Catholic school friends thought I, you know, become going to go to hell and all these kind of things. But that's a that is such a dramatic moment, and I remember because it had so much um, feeling for me walking into the junior high. The other thing is I knew no one, mm-hmm. and so. What a statement about myself that I chose education and to pursue that. Now, the thing that I will tell you is back then in the late 60s, early 70s, science was taught where it didn't have soul. And I look at physics now, and it's deeply spiritual. Quantum physics, chaos theory, I love that now. So I still have that predilection for science and technology. But once I took psychology and sociology, I was forever sold (laughs) to go into um, the social sciences. Katie, what's interesting that I reflect on is back then women were considered to go into nursing or to go into teaching. And I, I didn't think much beyond that, although I do remember wanting to be a U.S. senator. Oh, wow. I wanted to be a psychologist. So I did have other aspirations. But I felt that my gifts lay in teaching. And so that's what I pursued at Purdue was secondary ed social studies. Um, And I will also say that once I was in that, I realized, I don't know if that's enough. So I picked up a second major in interpersonal public communication, which brought in that love of uh, writing, of speaking, of just thinking about communication theory. Um, So high school was a very interesting time. I graduated in 1974. So I had been um, very much attuned to the political climate in the country at that time. I remember watching the 1968 Democratic National Convention, which was held in Chicago. There was the riots, and Mayor Daley reacted in a very um, interesting way. You know, my brothers were involved in the anti-war movement, so it was a very interesting time to be in school. Mm -hmm. And when I said I wanted to be a U.S. Senator, Katie, I grew up with this um, orientation about caring for others and giving voice to others, very much defined by my parents and my older siblings. And um, I say that because uh, being a U.S. Senator, I thought, and I know this sounds crazy, but I thought if I could be in politics, I could stop the KKK. Mm -hmm. Um, I really thought that if I became a politician, I could affect that. Um, And I remember in high school realizing that politics, because of learning more about government, may not be the place to really affect change, but what an idealist I was um, to have this deep hope that I could somehow impact civil rights. Mm -hmm. Recently I was asked to do something and I realized that that influence of speaking up, which um, I call being a dangerous woman, Mm -hmm. which means fearless and being a speaking up when silence would be easier, very much informed by my father, and a fascinating story, um, which also influenced what I studied, is he was uh, very much involved in the Catholic Church, but he fought a crucifix being placed in the first public park in our town because he felt that it would not be um, welcoming to other faiths. And I think back, wow, that was amazing. Um, And I also told the story, Katie, that I stopped going to church because our pastor told my sister's best friend, and my sister was nine years older than me, that a black male organist could not play in our church. He used the very offensive word to describe this person. Mm -hmm. And I remember going home to my parents and saying, there's no God in this church, so I'm not going anymore. Again, for my parents to support that, understand it, Um, I'm sure it broke some of my mother's heart, but they really allowed that voice to be spoken. So I know I'm kind of weaving back and forth here, but each each one of these things triggers another thought for me. Yeah, no, that's a... You had a very progressive family, which is... and supportive family, so it's really... It is. It's it's quite amazing. 
stuff. Yeah, and the times when I've looked and I, you know, lament about something that happened, we didn't have money, you know, I couldn't get clothes, <laughs> whatever you remember as, you know, sorrowful moments, I zoom way out and I say, wow, I am really blessed. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating, all seven of us pursued different paths, even though people say there's definitely roach traits that we all share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, from high school, you knew you wanted to go into teaching in some fashion. Mm -hmm. How did you land on Purdue? So, Katie, I used to tell this story, and I'd be so embarrassed telling it. <laughs> but I took this class called Mythic Lives, and what it is is back to the comment I made earlier. We looked at stories that we would tell about ourselves to reframe them, keeping the truth in them but seeing them differently. So how I came to Purdue was I followed my high school boyfriend, who was a year older and was here in engineering at Purdue. Purdue was not anything that my family was really, you know, knew. Um, one brother was up at the Calumet campus. Another brother had taken classes there as well. But Indiana University in Bloomington was where a lot of my family graduated from. So I followed Mark, did not open up any other letter from any school that wrote to me uh, oh, wow. asking me to consider them. I was singularly focused. Of course, we weren't even dating by the time I started my school year. <laughs> and I used to think, how could a relatively intelligent feminist have done that? And when I was in this class, and it was in my 40s or early 50s, a chiropractor, there was just six of us in this class, I forget what our assignment was that week, but she came in with almost like a poster board presentation as you do in a science fair, with six photographs of men on there. And she said, Bob in junior high taught me I love to hike. You know, Sam in high school taught me I love public policy. And when I listened to her, all of a sudden my mind went to, I am so grateful I followed my high school boyfriend because I came to Purdue. I would not have done that mm -hmm. had it not been for him. That wasn't the influence of a college for my family. Mm -hmm. So I am boundlessly grateful that I was limited in my perspective then because it led to a remarkable set of chapters here on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you had, you've had a long relationship with Purdue. Very much so. And a really, from what I've heard, very, very positive Absolutely. experience working with Betty Nelson and mm -hmm. the other deans of women and deans of students. Um, but what was your first impression of Purdue when you got here? Well, I actually had come down during my senior year. Um, Mark would come and get me, and I had some familiarity mm -hmm. with the campus, but not a sense of how to navigate it. And when my parents brought me, I stayed in Earhart Hall. That was my first year. I just remember thinking, wow, there's an elevator. You have to, go, <laughs> you have to get up on your floor. Um, and communal living was something I obviously was used to, coming yeah. from a large family with one bathroom and one shower. Mm -hmm. So having a roommate had always been a part of my life. Um, having to use the, the dorm facilities, um, I just remember thinking it was quite remarkable that you could go down for three meals and that there was always food and yeah. <laughs> much choice. Um, and so I think I was probably overwhelmed and yet found my way through. Mm -hmm. Found my way through. One of the beautiful things, and I think this is true, is there's research that Purdue did um, that I think Mitch Daniels brought in from Gallup mm -hmm. where they identified what causes engagement for university students. I was part of the survey that they did. And I think what they found is as long as you have one good friend, a project that gives you purpose, and a faculty or staff member that believes in you, the pr probability that you will have an engaged college life and a fulfilling life in the future is higher. Mm -hmm. That's my memory of it. And sure enough, I found really good friends on fourth floor of Earhart Hall. Um, I also had some faculty that I felt connected to, but not so much in the first year. Because, okay. Katie, those were those large mm -hmm. lectures. I mean, I remember going into classrooms that were 
300 students and having no connection whatsoever, not only to the topic, but to the faculty member. Um, but obviously that first year must have gone well for me to um, have then, you know, made my way into the rest of my career here at Purdue. I was in a sorority, and Katie, what I tell people is my family was not a Greek family. No one had been in um, a Greek life on college. My mother was in some type of sorority, because I have this film of her doing a, you know, ceremony, but it was a philanthropic sorority. It wasn't a college sorority. It was something in Hammond, Indiana, okay. that these women did philanthropic. But um, I just remember my family saying, oh, don't go Greek. You know, that's like awful. Well, of course, that just kind of, you know, caused me to say, I'm going to check it out. Mm -hmm. And because of my curiosity, I did go through Rush. And Katie, I just found um, a, a connection that I had not expected. So I'm sure that because I pledged Delta Gamma the spring of my first year, which would have been 1975, that being in a community of other women um, was very powerful. Kitty, I meant to tell you earlier that I spoke a lot about my father's influence. One of the things about my mom, she was very close to her two sisters and her mother. And she had three really good friends, Pat Austin, Betty McDermott, Marie Walsh. And think about it, seven kids, she was working, and Pat, Marie, and uh, Betty would come to the house Saturdays, they would drink coffee, uh, two of them smoked, two of them didn't, and laugh. And I would just sit at the table, not always understanding everything, but that feminine community, that spirit of caring for one another, they all had challenges in their life. Betty had eight children. She was my godmother. And yet to see that just really reinforced the power of friendship. And that's part of the community I talked about. Mm -hmm. That also factors into why the sorority was so important to me and what I'll share later about Betty and the other deans that I was involved with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that support system is really important like throughout your whole life. It was, and I was very close to my sister. She was like my surrogate mother because she was nine years older. And the fact that there was a girl that came into the family after the five <laughs> brothers, you know, I was just her bundle of joy. Yeah. And so that was a, a very influential part mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Was, um, so Earhart Hall, that was an all-woman dorm? It was. Well. It was. Okay. And I, you, it said, you asked the question here, were there any restrictions? And I know that we had... Uh, hours because I remember that if you wanted to come in after a certain time you had to go through a certain door but it wasn't the days of a woman being there to check to make sure you came home but certainly um, hours at the hall was accessible and if you didn't come in before doors were locked to go through another door and also guest hours mm -hmm. and obviously no alcohol um, which you know made total sense to me yeah So you were really surrounded by a lot of positive female role models. Absolutely. And, you know, people the same age as you as well. So. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we were talking about um, your time in Delta Gamma. So yeah. you held some leadership positions there as well, right? I did. And Katie, um, this weekend that I'm here at Purdue is the 80th anniversary of Delta Gamma's presence on campus. And um, what's fascinating is to see particularly people from my peer group that were here during that time really continue to be leaders in the sorority. And Katie, in a black and white misunderstanding when I left my undergraduate, I did not see until later the deep philanthropic arm of the sorority mm -hmm. and what it does to empower women um, and I say that because I watch some of my friends, sisters as we call them, just really hold the sorority up on a national level, serving in leadership positions. Um, many of us have been involved in raising funds for the house in terms of renovation, and it's actually going to do a complete rebuild in 2022, I think. Um, and it just inspired me to think I knew these women when I was 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. 
The story I told this weekend is that Delta Gamma, the house that I was honored to pledge, I had an impression of them as being very elite and that you had to have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And Katie, I had such a rebel in me um, that to go to Delta Gamma, I decided to wear my ugliest shirt and a <laughs> pair of ripped jeans. Okay. Um, which I, I look back and I think, why did I think this way? But I had this like rebel in me. Mm -hmm. And when I went to that house, I met a woman named Ann Levitt, and I just fell in love. What was so powerful about that is that a belief that was not formed in fact was so erroneous that it was completely disrupted. And my family at first was like, um, okay, you know, don't quite understand what you're doing, but it's a path you're choosing. What I loved about Delta Gamma, and this made a huge difference, it was the only house at that time that you could work to pay your house bill. Oh. So I did pots and pans, you know, I was a server, and it paid for most of my house bill, mm -hmm. which was the only way that I could have done something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a, that I'm sure helped in my first year to get connected, because then all of a sudden your life becomes going to the house, being with these other women. Um, and I still had my friends at Earhart, that meant a lot to me but there was a new type of community forming by being a member of Delta Gamma. Okay. So were you only at Earhart Hall the fir your first, first year? First year. Okay. Well, and what you'll hear me say is I ended up with a double major, mm -hmm. and it was going to take me four and a half years just to complete all the requirements. Mm -hmm. Because I was so involved on campus, I decided to stay for a full fifth year, and I became a residence hall counselor at Shree, which I okay. you know, can share more about in a bit. Um, and I decided to take graduate classes because I thought I might want to get a doctorate in organizational communications. So that fifth year was finishing undergrad and taking some grad courses when I was at Shreve. I ended up deciding that that wasn't the field I wanted to pursue. Um, and that was very interesting, Katie, to be at Shreve in a counselor position. Shreve was co-ed. One side, like one building was all male. The other side was all female. Um, to be a counselor and still, you know, past my sorority, which had been a big part of my life. When I was in Delta Gamma, I had the opportunity to be involved as an assistant rush chairperson, um, and that was so unique because it was the recruiting arm. And so it gave me a deep sense of how do you tell somebody what their experience may be if they come into your sorority. Mm -hmm. And then because of my love of teaching, I became what was called the pledge trainer, so it was vice president of pledge education. And Katie, that um, the women that I was blessed to be the pledge trainer for are among the closest from those college years. Um, we were talking this weekend, there was a time when the uh, house had a disruptive um, phase, and Jan Spurlock, who was at the celebration this weekend, she was the rush chair, I was her assistant rush chair, and Amy uh, Trevathan, who was not there this weekend, we looked at each other and we said, we're gonna help this house heal, and we're gonna really bring an amazing class of pledges. And um, we did. In fact, after I graduated, Delta Gamma at Purdue won the national chapter. So it was such a resurgence of bringing out the best of what it meant to be in that sorority. And I love being the pledge trainer. It was just amazing to orient, be present to these young women. Um, the sorority also, Katie, is how I began to get so involved on campus. When you have older women that say, they called me Roach Woman, you know, <laughs> and it's because I used to call everybody woman. So I'd be like, Katie Woman, you know, Susie Woman. And they joked because I had such feminist leanings that I was probably born a woman, so it was always a running <laughs> joke. But to have them say, why don't you consider this? And that's uh, how I became involved in the Association for Women Students. To have people that you care about reach out and say, here's something you want to consider, really helped shape you know, my time uh, at Purdue. So I look at Delta Gamma as a gateway and a threshold that really propelled me. And it's still a part of my life in terms of the friendships and the ways I contribute, mostly financially, to it so that other women can experience having that support system while they're in college. That's great. Yeah. Um, how has Rush changed 
just out of curiosity, I guess, from when you were yeah. going through yeah. as a freshman to, I don't know if you know too much about what's going on. Well, interesting because now. some of the women at my table that were part of my peer group in my pledge class are very involved in what's called the House Corporation, which is the adults that help ensure the financial stability and the future of the house. And um, when I was here, it was fairly intense, and it was all paper-driven, I think. But you would go to each house, um, and I think they were called Super Rush Saturdays or something like that. So like every half hour, and you had a counselor that was a Panhellenic counselor, obviously from a sorority, but they couldn't tell you which one because mm -hmm. they were um, sorority agnostic, if you will. They would take us to each house. You would go in. You would meet people very fast-paced. By the end, you were absolutely exhausted. But you could get a sense of the energy. Mm -hmm. And then you were invited back to rush parties, which were held during the week, usually doing an art and crafts. Um, you sometimes would meet people like I did, Ann Levitt, just by going over there for tea one day. And then we had where the semester would end, and you would come back early from Christmas break or holiday break, and you had Cokes, which were five parties longer, mm -hmm. and you would say who, so you didn't get, not everybody invited you to Cokes, but if you got more invitations than five, you could choose which ones you wanted to go to. And then from there, you said, here's who I'm still interested in, they would say the same thing, and if there was a match, that's where you would go. Okay. Katie, what's fascinating is I actually had the worst case of strep throat right before I came back. Oh, no. And I was no longer contagious, and um, I really wanted to come back. And I know that I probably wasn't like totally on. So the fact that I still made it through all of those and had <laughs> houses that wanted me, I just thought was pretty much a miracle. Mm -hmm. um, so it was quite a process. And then when I was in the house, Katie, you would turn in an application card. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow those were copied, and your picture was put on it. We had this big honking machine that projected. And we would talk about these women that we met. Mm -hmm. A lot of hours put into this. Fascinating discussions. And sometimes I'd be in those discussions and think, how the heck did I ever get in? <laughs> because, <laughs> You know, and we looked at things like academics, you know, the sense of the person, what activities they were in. Um, and so it was very extensive. Each house had a quota based on how many spaces they had. And so Delta Gamma might have 25, FIMU might have had 30. I understand now they do it completely differently. I don't even know if they use the words Cokes and Suits. Mm -hmm. But my colleagues and friends were telling me this weekend, shorties are given a number and they all have to take that number. So you're seeing more seniors move out because they need to bring in space for other people. So I do not think in any way it's the same mm -hmm. with all of those different events mm -hmm. through the whole first semester. But it was wonderful as a person considering it to get that much exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Um, so you had a lot of really positive relationships and experiences mm -hmm. through your sorority. Were there any not-so-positive experiences that you had? Well, um, of course. Yeah. So as I think about that, um, I remember not really enjoying a number of my classes the first two mm -hmm. years. Large lecture, required courses that didn't um, fuel my passion. And um, they oftentimes say that sometimes there's those of us that learn more outside the classroom. I was definitely one of those mm -hmm. people. Um, so I'm sure that the challenges of trying to navigate academically when I didn't feel pulled to it was not easy. Of course, now I look back and I think, compared to life, that was a very small thing. Mm -hmm. But when you're in that moment, it feels really big. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that my father had left my mother the second half of my senior year in high school, mm -hmm. which was 1974. Um, he came back a couple of times, but then they divorced in 1976. And Katie, I, I don't think I really felt the pain of that. Um, I'm very good in a crisis, so I immediately thought about how to take care of my parents. But I, I know that that was painful on an unconscious level. Um, so academically, there were some struggles. You know, I look back and there was times where I 
got into interesting discussions with other sisters that were not always easy. Mm-hmm. Katie, at the age of almost 64, you look back and you're like, okay, so Teresa, that was not bad at all. <laughs> but again, relative to that yeah. time, um, relative to that time. There's other things as I look at the other questions that will reveal some of the challenges. Yeah. I would say on the whole, though, I had an amazing, amazing opportunity. Katie, it's also my natural DNA. If you know anything about the Enneagram, I walk in the pattern of the two. One of the traits of my natural DNA for how I look at the world is I could lose my arms and legs, and I'd be like, hey, but I'm still alive. So I always see the goodness even in some of my darkest moments. So I tend to have that light perspective, which has served me well. Um, And I've learned as I've gotten older that to always speak with joy can be suppressive to others. Mm -hmm. So as I've led large teams, I realize that I'll be like, yeah, this is happening, but this is the goodness, that that can make them feel they can't speak their truth. So I've learned to more artfully allow for all that is not so positive to be spoken Mm -hmm. and to hold the polarity of joy and sorrow, light and and dark. a couple of other things that happened that we were laughing about this weekend is I was hit by a car oh, my fourth year in the house and Katie I was on the pedestrian island uh, just less than a block from my house at 303 Waldron and a Kappa Alpha Theta and a Kayo that I knew from organizations crossed the street and I remember thinking wow they almost got hit next thing I know I hear bam and a car had failed to yield and its back bumper took me off the pedestrian island. And I still have the police report because there's a chalk outlining of where my body was. And um, I mean, talk about an amazing event. The Purdue marching band had just finished their practice. They saw this woman flying through the air. The other two women were as close as you are to me, even closer. Nothing happened to them. They were still standing erect. All of my you know, books and everything flew through my arms. And everybody was laughing because, Katie, I pulled myself up and I said, would someone get my mortar board? I really need that. Um, Those papers are for a meeting I have tonight. (laughs) Would somebody let the house know I've been hit by a car because I won't be able to do pots and pans? The band thought I was in shock. And so they kept putting their band coats on me, and I kept getting laid down. And I would force myself back up. And a woman, most people around me were hysterical. And a woman um, said to me, where do you live? And I said, see that anchor? That's where I live. It's Delta Gamma, 303 Waldron. Just let them know that Roach Woman, you know, can't get to pots and pans tonight. She runs down there, goes in the house, and several of the people there this weekend remembered this. She said, one of your sisters has been hit. And they said, who? And she goes, I can't remember. (laughs) So, So somebody had the presence of mind to say, Here's our composite, and because I was an executive in the house, I was on the top row, and she said, her, and like 30 of my sisters that were in sweats and gym shorts because of the end of the day, come running. So I was surrounded by masses of people, and it took about an hour before the uh, police and an ambulance arrived because there had been another accident. And Katie, this is so classic. Um, The police officer said to me, you probably should go get checked do you want to go to the health center or to home hospital? And I said, which won't cost any money because I have no insurance. So I went to the health center. And uh, the story at that time was they didn't x-ray me, gave me a tetanus shot, watched me for a little bit, and when it came time to leave, several of my sorority sisters were there. I said, I don't think I can walk. Like, I can't get my shoe on. Do you have crutches? And they said, so sorry, we're out of them. We have a cane. And I said, "Mm, I don't think so. So my sisters did the firefighter block, (laughs) carried me to the car, got me in the house. Everybody was so warm and loving. The next day, my dad came down because a friend from the sorority drove me to the hospital. They thought both my legs were broken, and it was just one. Um, My dad immediately called Lloyd Combs, who was the director of the health center. He knew him from old sporting days and read him the riot act about how you could release this young woman (laughs) with a broken leg. Um, and Lloyd called me at the sorority to offer to get me one of the new casts that were the new plastic ones. And I was like, 
well, I don't think so. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, that was obviously a very traumatic event. Yeah. And um, Betty, who I knew then, offered to get a handicap sticker so friends could take me to class. And Katie, that like roach spirit, I was like, no. So there I am in November on crutches getting around to classes. Um, I mean, that, that was grit that, like I mentioned to you mm-hmm. earlier before we started this interview, revealed a, a equal measure of ignorance because I was just determined to make Very myself so. around, even though I was on this cast and it had a little rubber thing at the bottom so I could kind of put some weight on it. That's just a, a remarkable time. Um, so Katie, I look at these struggles and I say, relative to life, they were uh, not difficult, and yet back then they were. Yeah. And yet uh, the other characteristic I mention is I'll always see the goodness in all of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, all of them coming together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 it's amazing. <laughs> it is. I yeah. um. Yeah. A couple of first things that I wrote, Katie, that I just want to share. Um, and this part I shared with Anna Brown as well when she was interviewing me in her honors class, which was um, Honors 499, which I know you know about and you were part of. She was doing what the experience of sorority life was then. And I told Anna that it was a time of great polarity for me, Katie. I always thought of myself as really intelligent. And even in high school, when people would make fun of my civil rights beliefs or the fact that I would do so well, I never tried to mask my intelligence, which was pretty amazing for a woman back then. Mm -hmm. I didn't try to appear like I was not, uh, that I was without knowledge. In fact, I used to really dislike I Love Lucy Green Acres because the women on there portrayed themselves as not intelligent, and I did not like that at all. So I thought myself as this intelligent, really charming individual, but I didn't see myself as having any physical beauty. And it's interesting, Katie, I asked my mother once, because I was with a group of women in high school that were stunning, you know, up for queen and all these other kinds of things, and I said to my mom, do you think I'm pretty? My mother had unbelievable honesty, she looked at me and she said, well, your personality makes you so. You know, and on one hand, I wanted her to say, I think you're gorgeous. <laughs> but that convinced me that it was my inner spirit. Mm-hmm. So what happened is when I was rushing, you have a picture taken, and James Faust was a photographer. When I returned to campus my sophomore year, my picture was everywhere. It's actually one of my favorite pictures. I look really perky, you know. I was like this great smile. And I was like mortified. I mean, I was on the sidewalk. I was on buildings. And he was using it to advertise to have your rush application picture taken. What happened is, in my sophomore year, the house nominated me for Homecoming Queen. Oh, wow. And Katie, that just never was my reality. Mm -hmm. And yet... Um, And this is a vulnerable story, and yet it was kind of exciting, like for the first time for people to think, oh, Teresa's whatever word you might want to use. But then I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go campaign, and I'm not somebody to say, hey, look at me. So I actually would tell, like when I would walk around and meet people, I would talk about the ERA. (laughs) I mean, I had many of these young male students look at me like, what? And so the way I cope with that polarity of caring so much about equal rights and yet being seen for physical beauty um, was really a challenge to hold Mm -hmm. um, because it was the first time I felt, like I said, that I was seen being attractive, that my sorority sisters wanted to have me be the homecoming queen nominee, but I was so young Um, I really didn't have the maturity, but I I look back and I think I got hooked because I was nominated. Hooked by thinking that mattered. Great compliment, but it wasn't wasn't how I defined myself. So it was a really, Purdue had an interesting challenge for me to have had that happen. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was a very big part of um, an experience for me. Okay. Yeah. Did you end up winning Homecoming Queen? No, I did not. I, uh, um, 
I came in six out of the vote, which I only found out because somebody I knew was involved at the county. Mm -hmm. Most of the other nominees were seniors. Oh, okay. And so it was very unusual to have somebody as young as me. Mm -hmm. And Katie, I love to tell the story. James Faust, who was the photographer that did all the rush pictures, he was the big sorority photographer, so I got to know him very well. He did all the photos for my homecoming queen shoot. And <laughs> Katie, hundreds of pictures and by the end I mean my face is drooling <laughs> and we were outside because he thought I would be good in nature and you see these big welts because I ended up getting all these mosquito bites oh, no. <laughs> and I wish I could see those proofs now because I'm sure I would still laugh oh, that's um, yeah it was so some of my shorty sisters when they saw what I ended up doing in my life a few of them said to me Roach we didn't think you were intelligent they thought I was this um, pretty person who was really good socially. So to have wow. them see me later on, because um, they had already graduated, mm -hmm. and the other women saw me for my leadership position, but it was fascinating. Those that knew me my sophomore year yeah. formed an impression of me that was not accurate. Uh, not accurate. And that's okay, but it was mm -hmm. just, just an interesting little part of that story. Okay. Yeah. Oh, more on your involvement on campus, yeah. which is quite extensive. So you were involved in many, many organizations on campus. Um, I'm just going to ask you about kind of each one, yeah. and if you could just talk a little bit about your experience. Um, I'll start with Iron Key. So can you tell me a bit about your involvement with Iron Key? So, Kitty, um, Iron Key was an invitation, mm -hmm. and I can remember exactly the day that Jan Cooper mm -hmm. and Jane Brock, Jane was a Kappa, Jan was a Kappa Alpha Theta, came to Delta Gamma to personally extend the invitation to be an Iron Key. Mm -hmm. I had a blue blouse on. I was actually starting to change out of it because I was going to go wash pots and pans, you know, at the sorority. <laughs> And um, back then you had an intercom system, so they said, Roach woman, you have visitors. And I said, they said, Jane and Jan. I said, oh, bring them up. So there I am, and I know the room of the house I was in. And I was like, you guys, what is it? And they said, Teresa, we want to invite you to Iron Key. I burst into tears. And I kept saying, no, no, that can't be true. <laughs> to the point where they said, you are coming back next year, aren't you? <laughs> because I just did not ever see that that was something I'd be considered for. Mm -hmm. Iron Key was a small group. The intention was to be involved on campus, advise the president. Iron Key has continued to mature over the years. So that was a stunning um, experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, the other things like uh, Omicron, Delta, Kappa, Kappa Alpha, um, Pi and uh, Phi Alpha Theta were honoraries in content areas, leadership, education, history. And so it was certainly wonderful to be invited to them, you know, to go to the, the meetings, but they weren't as extensive as certainly my Iron Key involvement, which was during my last year. Mm -hmm. When I was interviewed by Ron Fruitt to be a residence hall counselor, and he ended up being the VP of Housing mm -hmm. and the union here on campus, a wonderful man. Um, he called me at home and said, you're so involved on campus, which we think is great, will you still have time to be a residence hall counselor? And I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So he took a chance on me, and it ended up being, you know, quite remarkable. And that was at Shreve Hall, right? When you were a counselor at Shreve Yeah, Hall? it was my okay. fifth year um, at Shreve, yeah. Okay. And what's some of the more memorable experiences you have from Iron Key? Well, um... Maury Kanoy, I think his name one, was the chair of the board of trustees at Purdue. And he would host us in his home. And um, there was something about being invited to what felt like hallowed halls to be in dialogue was very um, inspirational. Uh, at the time, President Hansen was the president, and Art and Nancy probably were... Um, one of the presidencies that so cared about students, okay. and in talking to some of the deans, because of what happened in the late 60s and the fact that students didn't feel they had as much of a voice, 
Art and Nancy actually really were a bridge, um, very student-oriented. Mm -hmm. And so being in those discussions with uh, other seniors that I knew um, and some that I was just getting to know on issues affecting campus and to feel like our voice mattered was pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful experience. Great. Um, and you're also involved in the Purdue Student Government as yeah. well, right? Yeah. At that time, Scott Sperling was the president of the Purdue Student Government. And Scott was in Iron Key with me. Um, he and I also, with uh, Susie Ogg uh, and Tom Rudin, were on the Peach Bowl Committee representing students. Purdue went to the Peach Bowl my last year, which was just a very fun thing because Purdue was not exactly a dominant football force back then. But Scott saw that I was a very active and engaged female leader. And so Scott asked me to start a brand new department at Purdue uh, called Women's Awareness. Okay. He also asked me if I would start the Communications Council with Brian Wise. And that was a remarkable set of experiences. Um, there's more to the Women's Awareness, and when we talk about the Association for Women Students, I'll weave that in. Okay. The Communications Council was all about finding representatives from all the housing units so that the leaders of PSG once a month could have a dialogue with them. And so Brian and I recruited people. Um, Purdue student government, you know, people had mixed reactions about it, but to create that conduit so that the elected student leaders felt like they were understanding what the needs of these people were that represented co-ops, sororities, fraternities, residence halls, was quite remarkable. Katie, when I was back here to get my doctorate, um, I happened to look at the exponent and it said, 20 years ago, Teresa Roach and Brian Wise started the communications council. Oh, I, like, wow. ah! I, was, I couldn't believe it. But, um, you know, that was just a remarkable experience because to think about representation of people and to give them voice just fit mm -hmm. with kind of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're ready, we'll talk about the Association for Women Students and... Yeah. So that was the first organization that I applied for. And Katie, my memory is that there were like representatives of junior board and executive board. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'll start at the lowest part of the hierarchy. Um, and I remember going to the dean of students office, which was located in Hubbardy Hall, and you would walk up a big flight of stairs. And it was a very welcoming environment. And being interviewed, my memory tells me it was in Betty Nelson's office. Okay. At least that's what I think. And Jane Brock was part of AWS and some other people. And Betty was the staff liaison and was just there to coach and uh, support, but not an active voice because as Betty and all of the people that helped student organizations, they really wanted the students to drive what was happening. And here I went in to just interview for the lowest level position and they said to me, well, Teresa, if you're involved, what would you like to see change? Katie, here I was 19, and this is the defining moment that launched my life with Betty. I said, well, maybe you want to do something besides bridal fairs. Turns out Purdue, and I found this from being interviewed by Anna Brown for the class I mentioned, Purdue was one of the last Big Ten schools to stop bridal fairs. Mm -hmm. And I just felt it was a limiting um, choice. I just felt that they should be opening women to all the possible paths and the unconscious and conscious bias about what the role of women should be in the 70s just felt very wrong to me. Mm -hmm. And I remember Betty sitting there and she raised an eyebrow like, hmm. They called me that night and they said, Teresa, we'd like you to be on the executive board. And I said, oh no, I, I can't be. I, I just started. I interviewed for this. And they said, well, we want you to be the secretary of the executive board. And I said, I can't do that. I don't know how to type. Because Katie, just a quick backstory. I decided to take typing and debate in the summer school before I started my first year of high school. Just to, you know, be involved in learning. And I wanted to get typing out of the way because I didn't want it to interfere with which I thought were more important classes. And I refused to learn how to type well. I mean, I literally said, I'm not going to get pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. 
I was 13. <laughs> and I had Mr. Hyman for my typing class, and he kept saying, I think you should try harder. And I was like, no. I got a C, which ended up impacting my GPA, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. And then later, I have to tell you, Katie, I was like, why didn't I learn how to keyboard? Because I had to pay people <laughs> for my papers. And actually, before I came back for my doctorate at the age of um, 40, I did a software package called Mavis Beacon. So now I can type with all fingers without looking, and I didn't learn that till my 40s. But what I'm telling you that is I said, I can't be the secretary. I don't know how to type. And they said, don't worry, we'll, you know, we'll figure it out. That was very arduous because that was back in the days where it was typewriters, mm -hmm. no correction ribbon, no whiteout. And when you made carbon copies, you know, you had to take like a little um, razor to clean up your typing. I I'm sure those minutes were an absolute mess. But that propelled me into being in an organization where the issues were focused around women um, and busting through that the bridal fair was not the only option um, for women. Katie, it's funny, this weekend as we were singing our songs from the sorority from 40 years ago, I reflected on the words and they weren't exactly about female leaders. A lot of the songs beyond the beautiful ones about sisterhood and friendship had physical characteristics in them. Okay. And I thought, wow, that probably was a dominant theme. Um, in reading Anna Brown's writing about sororities and fraternities, it triggered me to remember that there was a lot of um, bias about women inherent in the fraternity system in terms of objectifying women, the concept of little sisters. Mm -hmm. And I think I was oblivious to it, like it didn't affect me, but I knew that that would never be anything that I would ever participate in. But Association for Women Students was my first active voice as a female to look at women's issues at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Katie being at the student organization fair at the beginning of my um, junior year when I was in this role, and Mary Shoemaker, who to this day I keep trying to find her, she was president of the Feminist Union. She walked up to me on this booth, and we're the Association for Women Students, and she came up and blessed that woman's heart, Katie. She said to me, this is the stupidest organization I've ever seen, and you guys are nothing but fluff. I mean, and Katie, again, these are moments where I say, wow, I was a little bit more mature than I give myself credit for. I said, Mary, tell me more. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I didn't, like, push back or give her some syrupy answer, Mary and I became very connected, and she's the one that later when I did the Women's Awareness helped me create a Campus Safety Week. Mm -hmm. So Mary was um, powerful, and every two years I'll just put her name in or I'll try to find her through some Purdue connection, because mm -hmm. I would love to find her and say to her, Mary, you busted through the bubble and really made a huge difference in my life. I really admired her and appreciated her. Can you tell me more about the women's awareness? Yeah, so it was through that, not through AWS, that I did the Campus Safety Week. Uh, the other thing, Katie, I want to say a little bit more about that, but Title IX had been passed, and I did not see evidence of equality for <clears throat> female sports. And um, through my Iron Key connection, I actually went and met with the athletic director, the associate athletic director, who was Fred Schaus, and George King was the athletic director. And I think back about how I went in there, and I was like, so show me your budgets. I don't think you're paying the same. Mm -hmm. And they were like, wah! And I said, I want to see the gym facilities because you would walk into the buildings and you knew that the women's sports were an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Fred ended up being an iron key with me. And one time at an event, he made a comment about, you know, what a radical I was. And I remember thinking, you know, woe the day you say that, but uh, there was not equality. And so in women's awareness, I not only created this campus security week with Mary and others, which was very profound, but I felt it legitimized my ability to go knock on doors to say what's happening. Mm -hmm. The Campus Safety Week was, you think about it, it's still 
prevalent today where women can't always feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so it was designed to provide markers for where there'd be places to call. Uh, I had a huge session that Mary and I organized with speakers. Beth Stone was on the panel. Brenda King, who was the first female Purdue officer, uh, was on, on the panel. And we invited every woman to just come and think about what's happening and what they could do. Okay. Um, and I read today that these issues are still yeah. there. And I think back, this, this was in the 70s, you know, and um, it was just a major issue. So the women's awareness after being in AWS was a chance to extend much more of my beliefs about how women should be treated and to look for evidence that they were. Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate Mary Shoemaker for you know busting that bubble. AWS was not happy that I formed this new department. The women's awareness? Uh-huh, oh. because they felt it might be a competition. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. I could see why they thought I might draw attention, but I invited them to be part of the campus Safety Week. Because, Katie, one thing I mentioned about my mother and her friends, and when I tell you the story of Betty, being involved, watching my mother, and then being with Betty, Bev, Barb, Barbara Ellsbury, Linda Ewing, Sandy Monroe, my list is endless. What I saw them do was they didn't take power by taking it from another. Power was shared, and they lifted each other up. So I thought, we have enough coming at us as females. We need to be in solidarity. Um, and so that defined me at such a young age. And if you talk to people that worked with me, they'll say, I've had many female executives early on that I would say, you know, X, just want you to know, if you need to win, I give you whatever you need because I'm not up for people watching how we may not support one another. Mm -hmm. I only work in support. And at first people thought, that's really strange. Mm -hmm. But that experience, particularly through the women's groups, being exposed to phenomenal leaders here, really um, built that as a solid part of my orientation and DNA in life. Okay. Yeah. And so did, um, after that interaction with Mary Shoemaker with the Feminist Union, did the Feminist Union and AWS work together on anything? Um, I, I don't have all complete stories, but I do remember being the bridge to Mary. And she and I would get together um, because she just read things that I had not read. Mm -hmm. She provoked my thinking um, in ways that I had not considered, and I was so grateful to her. So I just remember she and I would meet. My recollection, Katie, is that I was much more involved with Mary when I became um, started Women's Awareness. Okay. Uh, and I hope that story's correct, but that is my recall. It was mm -hmm. through that vehicle that I felt um, much more okay. involved in things on campus. Okay. Yeah. And so is Women's Awareness responsible for those emergency phones around on campus? Katie, I, I would say no to that. Okay. Um, I think they were there, and the issue was making sure people were aware of them. Okay. Um, yeah, I I would never claim that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was other people far more um, involved in staff roles that cared as much about this issue as certainly those of us that were student okay. leaders. Yeah. Okay. So women's awareness mostly was providing training or programming to make people aware of the resources that were available to them, is that right? Programming, specifically in campus safety, and then advocacy on certain issues. And Katie, I, I laugh at this, but there was a film that Betty or Barb or Bev or someone told me about for um, Equal Rights Amendment. And so I remember asking Scott, as the president of PSG, if I could use my budget to buy that film. And I remember video, uh, doing a preview, and it had to be in film. It couldn't have been a video. Um, and going into a dark room in Stewart Center <laughs> watching it and just sobbing because it was such a, a statement about women trying to ensure there was equal rights. And so when I first went to California, after I'd been recruited for my master's, I was very involved in the National Organization of Women now because we were still trying to get the ERA passed. And of course, as you know, it 
it failed to be ratified back then, but it seems to be getting a resurgence again mm -hmm. uh, that something may happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so you, you had wanted to shift um, AWS away from just providing bridal fairs. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit more about how you did that and what AWS really focused on in addition to or instead of the well, bridal the, fairs? What was beautiful about AWS it seemed to be able to hold all mm -hmm. at that time for the women that were interested in what it meant to consider marriage as a viable alternative and to give rise to someone like me who looked at other kinds of programming. Um, I don't remember, Katie, but I know that we did some evening sessions on topics. Mm -hmm. One of the other things, and I don't remember if it was my AWS or Women's Awareness, but there was a um, request for Purdue to consider having a Women's Studies department. And I remember a woman whose name I cannot remember was a very renowned person from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I think they had one of the premier Women's Studies and hosting, somehow is involved in organizing the hosting of her to come to speak about it. Very light attendance. And the dean of the Humanities, Social Studies, and Education School, where this would have been considered, I remember, um, Katie, that he sat in the front row and he did not look at the speaker the entire evening. He turned his body as if it was like, I'm not listening. Oh, wow. And bless that woman's heart, she knew exactly what was happening. She just kept on going, and I thought, you know, Purdue someday is desperately going to need this program. And of course, it's now a very thriving mm -hmm. part of Purdue's programming, which is just utterly delightful. Mm -hmm. Back then, people could reveal their biases much more, you know, openly, where, um, not that that still doesn't happen, but I'm pretty horrified to think that a major player at Purdue uh, just rejected even the possibility of a women's study program at that time. So I know I'm kind of going back and forth, but it's a mosaic of mm -hmm. multiple stories and um, it kind of meshes together for me between the organization that afforded me the opportunity to speak up. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, Katie, as I prepared for this, of the meetings where I would go in, because again it gave me license to set up meetings with various Purdue executives, and going in, and I had such like a charge, and I was like, you're not moving fast enough, and you need to do this, and <laughs> one person in particular, you know, explained to me that things take time, and of course, I didn't want to hear any, any of that. Mm -hmm. um, it felt to me like the law had been passed, it should be happening, yeah. um, and what fascinates me, Katie, is this was the 70s. And we're still fighting some of the same, mm -hmm. same things. Mm -hmm. The Me Too movement I've been very engaged with because of now serving as a public servant to the city um, and just really giving rise to that whole movement and thinking how many years there was unspoken of people feeling biased, not safe, discriminated against, harassed. And even though some people have been like, why are they saying these things now, I'm like, put the light on it, hallelujah, um, we needed to break through. And there's two trends that I think are happening in the world today that are signals that really reveal it'll never go away, and that is the power inequity and the way power and wealth is distributed. I think if you are awake at all, you see that that movement, that voice is not going to go away. And I think um, the women's issues have really reached front and center. Disheartening to see that there may have been bias about a female candidate for president, and yet um, I'm grateful that many of them have been on a national stage. It's fascinating, I would think about, as a developed country, that we're one of the few developed countries that have never had a female leading the country. It's quite interesting to reflect on what's happened in our own country um, on this particular topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very reflective of the feminist movement in the 70s, I feel like. Yeah. It was a time of great explosion. 
Katie, there is a book by Gail Collins, I think it is, and it was like the year that everything changed. And I actually read that in an honors point. Oh, online. did you? <laughs> well, Katie, I, I go back and I read, and I'm like, that was my era. Mm-hmm. And part of why I didn't realize that some of the things I did, Betty attributes to being a game changer, I just felt like this is what we're supposed to do. I didn't mm-hmm. see it as, wow, that's different. But in retrospect, to show up like that was pretty bold and courageous. Again, as you heard me say earlier, I'm sure my family really influenced that. Having somebody like Betty, um, who my relationship with her has spanned 40 years, Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she never told me what to say, but she created the conditions for my voice to be heard. And... Betty led me to Barb Cook, who led me to Beth Stone. I mean, I was Helen Schleeman, Dorothy Stratton, um, the Dean's Bible, which you know is a a wonderful book written by Angie Klink. I went back and read that, even though I was interviewed for it. And There's a picture of Betty, Barb, and Kai uh, when we were back on campus. And I was like, wow, I was swimming in a powerful time. Mm -hmm. I mean, these women just did so much. I also have to say there was many male mentors that I had, Tony Hawkins, who became the dean of students, uh, Dick Stewart, who was the head of what was called the Placement Center. Mm -hmm. So I also had some male mentors that were very instrumental, and they were quite different in the way that they were not biased and treated women and men equally. But it was an amazing time to be here on campus. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the campus climate during, you know, it was you know, the mid-70s, so Title IX had just been passed. The yep. ERA, um, well, they were trying to ratify the ERA, so I might be jumping a bit ahead, No, but no, like no, I just, <laughs> part of is at, that so. because I was so enmeshed in it, I, um, I went back and I just took some notes because, yes, Title IX had been passed, but it was not fully implemented. In mm-hmm. fact, you know, some of us feel that the tail, tail end of it is still being implemented. And look what's happening with the women's soccer team. Yeah. You know, they bring in more revenue than the men's soccer team, and they're still fighting for equal pay. In fact, that was one thing that the athletic department here at Purdue said to me when I said, why are you not investing in women's sports? And I would not back off from that question. And Katie, because I'm short, I think people thought, oh, she's not so feisty, but I was like right there. Mm-hmm. Finally, one of them said, Teresa doesn't make as much revenue as the male sports or male teams. And I said, I don't care. It's not about revenue. It's about experience. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's just fascinating to watch how that, that all goes. But um, the Vietnam War ended in 1975, so that would have been the end of my first year. Um, the anti-war protests had really shifted. They were very dominant in the... 60s, you know, where my brothers were going to anti-war protests and my sister into the 70s. You know, it was a heady time around civil rights. Uh, My high school actually, uh, the teachers went on strike. First time ever in that high school in a long time. So I was very aware through older siblings and the political climate that our country was, um, had cataclysmic ruptures happening. Purdue is not exactly the hotbed of liberalism, and we're in a more conservative state, but was fascinating. Uh, The deans have told me stories about some of the political unrest and the students wanting to occupy Hubdi Hall. Mm -hmm. And I credit um, Art Hansen, Beth Stone, Barb Cook as being bridge builders to really listen to the students and find ways forward. Um, Katie, I reflected on much of what I've read that where I felt the women's movement missed is we never really found a way to intersect uh, women that are uh, black females, Hispanic, Latinx to be part of the movement. I think we missed the intersectionality of that. I think that still is somewhat present. Well, not still somewhat. It's still present today. So for me to be in the two social movements of women's rights and civil rights, it was a a heady time. Um, And what's interesting is I thought we were making progress, 
and then seeing more recent years, I'm like, wow, we've got a long, <laughs> we've got a long way to go. Where I'm at in the city, we do a lot on equity, diversity, and inclusion. I used to feel like I knew that space. It's a green field now. I feel like it's organic, and I'm learning. So as a city, our city council has passed a priority, equity for all, leading with race. Because what we've really plunged ourselves into is that if you can disrupt the longest systemically held, institutionally built ism, then the rest will fall. Mm -hmm. And so I wish we had been more present to that then. Mm -hmm. um, the whole concept of racial equality was equally important to me, more when I was a graduate student. And Katie, when you asked about experiences earlier, during my master's I was an intern at the Dean of Students Office. And the black uh, female sororities, presidents came and met with me and they asked me if I would be a judge at their big dance competition where the black fraternities would come and perform and they would judge. And I said, why me? Like I was like, wow, this is such an honor. And they said, because we think you're cool. <laughs> when I went there, I was the only female that was white. There was no other, um, uh, I, was the, I was the O in the X's, which is mm -hmm. the famous film that came out then about what's it like. And I remember thinking, and I was my early 20s, this is what they feel like every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I was on the, the panel to judge. It's a fascinating cultural experience to be part of. And then they just started all openly dancing, and somebody invited me to dance, and I went, me? And I looked around, <laughs> me? <laughs> I just remember to this day what it felt like to be the only white person and realizing this is their reality. Mm -hmm. um, so it was later years that I felt that I was finding the personal intersection, mm -hmm. but I did not see that intertwine as much as I wish it could have been back then. And that's just my story, my memory. Mm -hmm. I don't know if others would say the same. Okay. And that was the feeling on campus too. Yeah, I mean, um, when I was a residence hall counselor at Treve, we had an incident where there was a a black male student that decided that he no longer wanted to complete the initiation for a black fraternity. And he was living in the residence hall. And um, some of the members of the black fraternity came to get him. And one of my fellow counselors, Frank Sujeki, you know, had to have a confrontation. And I got so curious about why that mattered so much. And some of the things they would do for their initiation felt harsh to me. Mm -hmm. And in talking to these female leaders of sororities to understand it, and some of the black fraternity presidents, what they told me is that they have a different initiation to prepare them for what it's like to survive in a mm -hmm. white people's world. Okay. So um, it's like they would, they told me, Teresa, we sing these songs, we do these things, to toughen us up, and I just thought, what a different experience than mine were. You know, we had teas and cupcakes. I mean, yeah. and I just, it heavily influenced me. Mm -hmm. And I was so grateful that I had that experience here at Purdue, because then when I moved to the Bay Area, my ability to understand the world when identities are different was just more informed. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, during your time here, the so I think this was the late 70s, though. Mm -hmm. You were still at Purdue, right? I received my undergraduate in 79, okay. and then finished my master's in 81, and how I came back here for my master's, if there's time, is one of my mm -hmm. favorite stories to tell. Okay, we will get to that soon. Um, did you know of the Sisters for Health Education organization? That actually started in 1978, I think it was. Um, no, 70, yeah, 78, and a, I remember the woman's name was Marion Wiseman. Okay. And she, with two other people, um, really felt that women's health was not being responded to, not honored. Um, there were some horrific stories of females that would go to the health center and were not really feeling like they were educated on uh, reproductive rights and what they could do for 
birth control and how to stay safe. And so they started that. Mm -hmm. And it was at the tail end of my undergraduate years uh, because 78 was my last year of my fifth, in my fifth year. Mm -hmm. So I was familiar with them um, and was just very grateful because they produced some materials. They spoke with a lot of agency to really change the nature of women's health. And I think they started a clinic it was in the Wellesleyan Church that they had mm -hmm. a clinic set up. And um, boy, what a huge statement for them to have made and to um, act on. Well, I would deeply appreciated them. Mm -hmm. I personally had never felt that I had received any bias when I went to Health Center. I was on birth control back then. I also know that I benefited greatly by having an older sister who really uh, you know, she gave me the book, Our, Our Bodies, Ourselves, which came out in the early 70s. So through my own personal relationships, I was very educated and exposed. That wasn't the story for a lot of women on campus during that time. Okay. And do you know anything about their closing? No, no. I do not. Okay. I do not. And I'm sorry that I don't. That's fine. Yeah. We, they're a bit of a mystery to us. We only have record of them being around for about three years? What I'd like to tell as the story is that mm -hmm. other institutions may have finally picked up and changed. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would like to tell, but I don't know that factually. Okay, okay great. Um, so I think we've already covered a lot of Title IX, unless there's anything yeah. else that you want to add to that? Um, you know, the one thing I did benefit from, and it wasn't so much Title IX, but it was definitely something, I was very athletic, played sports. In high school, there were not uh, women's teams. We only had intramurals that came later. Uh, I think my senior year, they were just starting to look at female teams. Um, and so I was very involved in intramurals at the sorority, mm -hmm. which was a great outlet to legitimize the desire to have physical activity. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was on the team that won the championship for baseball, called it softball, track and field. And so I was very grateful that even though that wasn't a Title IX, that being involved in the sorority allowed me to still have that part of my life okay. um, reinforced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so you really want to talk about your time moving from your undergrad into your mm -hmm. master's, and that also ties in really well with your experience with the Dean of Women and yeah. Students. So do you want to talk a little bit about Absolutely. that So Katie, um, every time I'm interviewed or anyone is willing to hear her story, I weave the story of Betty in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Betty has such an energetic embrace of life. And any time that I felt my spirits flagging or had some conversation with some Purdue leader that wasn't kind to me, Betty was there. I remember going to her office with this passionate, like, we've got to get this done. And, you know, she was just such an encourager, a supporter. Uh, she held the container when I felt like I was losing my own voice. Um, I just am indebted to Betty, and she is one of my closest friends. And one of the great things, and this plays into coming back for graduate school here, is I was going to follow the path of my mentors to go into college student personnel mm -hmm. administration. And so I applied to graduate schools, not Purdue. Got accepted to all five, and Katie, I look back I was so ignorant with some very black and white thoughts. I really thought because of all the things I was involved in at Purdue, old masters, everything that I was, learned all that possibly could be learned on this campus. And I accepted to go to Indiana University because they had a wonderful master's program. July of 1979, I was at home, coming home from working as a waitress uh, during the summer to earn money, and Barb Cook called me. and. Barb at that time was the associate dean of students, and Betty was, I think, an assistant. I don't remember their, their titles, but Bev Stone was still the active dean of, dean of students, and she was the first dean of students when they merged both the uh, females and males. And um, 
Barb said, Teresa, we were, we were talking about you and we're concerned for you. And I was like, oh, Barb, that's just so nice. You know, um, tell me more. And she said, well, Betty Greenleaf, who was in charge of the program at IU, had died, I think, the year before. And Barb said, we're just not sure you're going to get the education that you need. We want you to come back here. And I said, Barb, I haven't even applied. She goes, I've already called Bruce Scherzer. <laughs> You've been accepted. And we want to offer you a dean of students internship. Katie, can you imagine that? That these people so believed in me and cared about me and loved me to extend that, that opportunity. What was so powerful, Katie, and this is a deep lesson, so here I've been a student leader involved with them through all these activities, and then I was, I'm going to say this word loosely, a peer. I was a staff member on their team. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm walking into the Dean of Students as an employee now, not as a student. Mm -hmm. And they made it as if that was the most normal thing that anybody would do. So I think about how they created how one could keep becoming. Mm -hmm. And when they would talk to me, it wasn't as if I were a student leader, but as a staff colleague. And that was such a remarkable experience to come back to the place where I'd learned so much and to have people accept me in a new way. Um, that internship was one of the most phenomenal things I could have been involved in. So then I had a different relationship with Betty and Barb and Bev and all of them where I was, I always was an equal. They never made you feel less than. But to be in that space was so profound. What amazes me is I completed my master's, and I could have gone on into any kind of um, academic counseling, career center, dean of students, residence halls, and or else I could have been a marriage and family therapist. But what stuns me, and I'm not sure I really understood this, my second year, I was an intern in what was called the placement office, and Dick Stewart was my um, manager, another remarkable person that saw something in me I didn't see in myself and exposed me to a lot of things. And he said to me, Teresa, I really think you'd be better off working in the private sector. There's only one company, I think, that would match your values and principles. It's Hewlett Packard, and there's an interview for you tomorrow. And I ended up going. So here are these women that had lifted me and held me, and these other men. I said, I'm going to take a different path. They didn't blink an eye. And I just think what love they had for myself and so many others, because Katie, this is just my story. I meet people like Rusty Rolf, who tells a story about Park Cook. I mean, we all have these remarkable stories. Um, I learned also that you could stay in one place for all of your life and never learn everything that was possible. Mm -hmm. And that people are mysteries that continue to unfold in front of you and none of us should ever close the folder mm -hmm. on a person. Those were remarkable lessons to learn. So the return to Purdue for graduate school was really amazing. Mm -hmm. And then again for your doctorate, right? Yeah, so I always knew when I was little that I would continue on uh, for education, I love to learn. It's just, uh, it's more important to me than hunger. You know, I'll, I'll read before I'll eat, which is not <laughs> always the best, but um, my husband and I, he always knew I wanted to go back for my doctorate. I was uh, chief HR officer for a high-tech company. We had this home we built in the Sierra Foothills, and he said, why don't we both go back at the same time and let's go to Purdue? And I said, I don't believe you because you said you'd never step up on the Purdue campus. He's a Penn State grad. So three months later, I said, are you still game? And he said, yes. So at the age of 40, where we were blessed to have a, a baby, Kai, that um, I gave birth to in 1995, one month after they were born, we made our way out to Purdue. And so I had a chapter as a doctoral student completely absorbed as a full-time mom. David and I used up all of our savings so we could have that chapter with Kai for five and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I received a doctorate in education. Um, and I have as many wonderful stories of the faculty and people that I met during that time. 
And I remember David said to me when we first got here, where's the grocery store? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I, didn't have a, I didn't drive to the grocery store. And once again, Katie, Bev, Betty, Barb, Tony, all these people accepted me as a mother. I mean, so I have had the rich opportunity of coming back at different points in my life and people seeing me then and not holding me for what they remember. Yes. Katie, the other thing I meant to share with you, uh, my graduate program, my mother died suddenly. Um, unexpectedly, she actually passed out at work and died seven days later. She had emphysema, which we knew. Um, and the shock of that was unbelievable. And Betty and Barb and Tony drove up for the memorial service. And I was in shock, but they were just so gracious to be there. And so once again, I was in this community of people that loved me through a very trying emotional time. So that's why my threads here are so strong. And I'm sorry, this, no. you know, it's, to be loved that much is a great gift. And part of the reason I come back is to pay it back, because the only way I can keep saying thank you to all that's been given to me is to pay it forward. For me to have Kai, our child be here from 1995 until we left in February of 2001. What a remarkable chapter. Mm -hmm. And that was the year that the women's team won the basketball, national oh, basketball. Nice. So we decided to expose Kai to everything. So we would go to the female sporting events, you know, and, and it was just such a wonderful time. And while they have some memory of this, I think it's deeply in their soul about our time that was here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Is it time? Well, I just wanted to be cognizant of your time. So it is 10, just 5 after 10.30, so 10.35. Okay. Um, we can keep going if you want, or we can... Well, let's just pause, because I think we've... Um, as I just look at what you asked me to think about, uh, greatest accomplishments, struggles... Um, and then, is there anything else I would like to mention to your time at Purdue? I think I can wrap up with a couple of thoughts, Katie, if that's okay. Fantastic, yeah. Um, what I learned, I already mentioned once. No one gains power by taking another, and women lift each other up. One of the comments I wrote is there's enough to go around. And what I mean by that is there's enough for everybody to contribute. Mm -hmm. Stephen Covey in the brilliant book he did called The Seven Habits for Highly Effective People talks about the abundance mentality. And that's what I experienced here. Several times that I would say I awakened my consciousness um, and I learned what it meant to have my own voice. Uh, the conditions, the people I met, the experiences I have certainly gave rise to that. I, I do want to mention I had many outstanding faculty members through the, through the years. Um, which I'm very grateful for. And um, I said that my threads here are so strong, and I don't know that I can ever stop feeling just plain grateful, Katie. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about the five deans, my experiences, something really special is very present here at Purdue. Very few colleagues that I've met working around the world at many different companies have any experience like what I speak about here at mm -hmm. Purdue. So Katie, I think those are probably my last thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that there's plenty of more stories, but I feel like I've hit the Great. highlights of what was a remarkable time to be a female here at Purdue in the 70s and then to come back later. So thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Yeah.